everyone. Frank the Pug here with the look back at the Men in Black movies. MIB is a top secret agency that monitors extraterrestrials. How are you doing, fellas? Some are straight up gorgeous like me. If I say so myself, I do find the overall effect very slimming. Others are really hideous alien creatures that blow snot. Congratulations, Reg. It's a Squid. Now you got Agent K. That's Tommy Lee Jones. We'll take it from here. And Agent J, a young NYPD recruit, the one and only Will Smith. I make this look good. These cool dudes walk around in black suits, shades, and they're always armed with this clever little gadget called the Neuralizer. Would you stop that? What? And our heroes take on this nasty alien bug race. I'm sorry. Was that your auntie? and find the energy source called the galaxy. Together, we save the world from the scum of the universe. In MIB 2, our favorite agents are back. I want one of those. This time, battling a Kylothian named Serlina. Hell no. Who's coming after our greatest treasure, the Light of Zartha. For the record, Laura Flynn Boyle is lovely and doesn't have serpent arms. Agent J likes Rosario Dawson so much, he doesn't neuralize her. What about the flashy thing? I'll flash you some other time. And to be fair, she's the kind of woman even worms have a thing for. This is Laura. Hey, hey. All right. Agent hey, right here. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, like you got a shot. Now, Agent K has no memory. There's something ugly for you, Slick. And Jay has to convince him to get back in the black suit and save the world with the help of yours truly. Go on now, go. Walk out the door. Frank. After J and K save the day, we are on to MIB3, where we go back to 1969. This time, a badass biker named Boris the Animal escapes prison and travels back in time to kill Agent K. You don't know it, K, but you're already dead. When Jay learns about the plot, he's been dead for over 40 years. He time travels back to save his partner in a great moment in American history. To set foot on the moon. Plus, Josh Brolin plays a young Tommy Lee Jones. We'll take it from here. K! K! Ah! Now that you're all caught up, all hail J! All hail J! Forget everything you know. And get ready for MIB International. We are the best kept secret in the universe. I know. I want to Meet Agent H and the new kid on the team, Agent M. Our heroes are trying to find a mole in London while fighting an evil arms dealer. Oh, and she's H's ex. So what could possibly go wrong there? You got black suits, black shades, and more Frank. Move it, lady. Top dog walking through. You even got Liam Neeson and Emma Thompson for extra goodness. Boom, pug out. And yes, that's my furry little butt. <laughs> I looked like a joint down the barrel. <laughs> uh, uh, what is Article 13? Immediate termination, followed by neuralization. Put that away. Okay. I don't have sunglasses. So where am I? <laughs> Ugh, damn it. We used to be so insane. The way we move is like so colored. Oh. <laughs> Let's go old school. But this one time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, this is how you do it like a bro. <laughs> <laughs> Claims to have been acting alone. Sorry, that's not good, is it? Don't bitch about. You heard him. The box. I did myself. Yeah. He lived for it. He died for it. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Why? What? Why? Why? <laughs> Am I missing something? <laughs> oh. That was you this time. Oh, we had that. We could have recovered for that. Do it again. I don't know what to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. sorry. I don't believe you'd ever you can believe everything. Come on, Luxor! That's it. <laughs> I didn't say it right. <laughs> I couldn't have Oh, don't try and blame me. I'm not. That was my fault. Ew. 
Give me a second, just give me a second. Wow, you didn't screw up. <laughs> I hired these people. I've made a lot of movies with ensemble cast, and the trick is to make sure they all fit in the same world. And if you can get that, then you've scored. But to go beyond that, to have chemistry where you just want to see them together because they interact in a way that's so entertaining, that's the holy grail. That's actually kind of deep. Chris Hemsworth is the first actor we went to to play Agent H, and he very luckily saw what we saw in the film. He committed fairly quickly. Oh, hey, guys! Which leading man is charismatic, self-deprecating, funny, and sort of effortless? I don't know who else does that other than Chris right now. He has a pretty unorthodox approach to things. He tends to operate under his own banner, if you will. I have a very strict no men in black policy. Men in black, and morons in black, if you ask me. <laughs> what a bunch of dicks, am I right? Chris is the six foot five, appealing guy who could just really rest on being a superstar. What's up with that guy? <laughs> But the truth is, he really goes in deep to give you a well-rounded character. Chris, I like being with a lot, actually. He reminds me of a younger sort of Roger Moore, so he's got a suave thing to him. He's very easy on the eyes, certainly for the girls and the boys, too, I guess. I think Chris works so tirelessly at making sure that the character feels well-rounded and that it's lived in, and then, you know, he's so gifted at comedy. We don't want to advertise our current profession, if you know what I mean, yeah? Mm -hmm. Look, it's the Betty Black. <laughs> Aliens got down. We yeah, do I that. get it. <clears throat> yeah, good. Great, perfect. How about me? How do I look? <laughs> I didn't know what to expect from Tessa. I just knew she was extremely talented. The day of the table read, she opened that first page and blew us away. And I knew this is my agent M. He's, you know, wildly talented and, and has a great sense of humor and a great sense of timing. A-L-I-E-N-S. I don't know why you always insist on whispering and spelling that. You know, not only is she strong and able and all that sort of thing, but she's very funny. It was great to not have to sort of work on a chemistry and, and, and find our rhythm. You know, we came off Thor 3 and Avengers straight into this and picked up where we left off, basically. So having played Valkyrie and, and Thor not that long ago, we're, we're constantly trying to figure out how is this dynamic different? What can we bring? Thor and Valkyrie, I think one of the best on-screen duos in the last decade. I get a chance to put them together again in Men in Black, and it is amazing. Their chemistry is off the chart. I think the best part of our performance has been where Gary gives us our take at the end of each sort of setup, and we get to kind of just rub the edges off it and kind of, you know, improvise. They're nice, and they're fun, and there's also beautiful collaboration between them. I can see that they've worked together before, so on set, they kind of magnetize together. They dance, and they have fun, and they communicate, and they welcome me in, but I like stepping back. And, and watching them. Chris has such dexterity. He's so fun to play with. He doesn't miss a beat in terms of improv -ing. A high-ranking member of the Jababian royal family dies on your watch, murdered by assailants that you can't identify for reasons that you cannot begin to fathom. Is that, is that, is that about right? I switched off the moment you started talking. I, I don't know. He's just a dream to work with. Tessa's so character embodies a huge amount of intelligence and intrigue into this world, uh, searching for the truth because she was told by, oh, uh, Emma Thompson's character that there was something up with the London branch of MIB. Here's your first assignment. I think we may have a problem in London. Emma is returning as, as Agent O, the head of the New York MIB Bureau. She appears to be working alone. So a random civilian with zero training simply waltzes in off the street. I'm just thrilled to be back in my role as um, O, the leader of the organization. Some of the finest acting that I probably have ever done in the course of my career is playing cool around Emma Thompson. I have been such a fan of hers for such a long time. And Gary came up to me and then he goes, oh, Tessa, I'm not quite sure what you're trying to do the way that you're staring at O. Is there something I don't know about that you're trying to play? And I was like, no, I'm just staring at her act. I'm so sorry. It's never who you think it is.
We often say movies are only as good as their villains. Liam Neeson, <laughs> again, incredible. I so kind and gentle. I play this character called High T. He has a very special relationship with H. I know it's a cliche to say, but I think he's very much a father figure in his life. Liam is a consummate actor and a true star in his own right. He literally may be the only actor who Chris Hemsworth can look up to since Chris is about 6'3", and Liam is about 6'5". He's an indispensable part of the cast. He was very specific on making sure that mentorship was clear and the father-son relationship was evident. Basically, it's just sort of the heart of the film, or the heart for my character, when he finds out he was neuralized and it was all a big lie. The person that had lied to him was his father figure. You were always like a son to him. <laughs> Bonnie was my favorite thing when I read the draft that first got sent to me. And he's deliciously funny, and he's played by Kumail Nanjiani, who I begged to make this movie. When I read that role, I said he would be absolutely perfect. And when he found out that it was an alien assassin that's four inches tall, he was in. I was excited to play a CG character. I've never done that. The whole thing with the dots on my face and the facial capture and all that. So I was really excited. And then they sent me the designs for Pawnee, the character. Then I got even more excited. Having him on set with us and him being able to throw such fun improvs at us was hugely beneficial. It's a very unique process. I've never actually worked like this. I've never done this kind of thing where I sort of do basically a different line every time. We do not kill Jabavians nor participate in the murder of. I'm not saying we couldn't kill Jabavians. Jabavians are hard to kill. This is non-negotiable. Well, it's slightly negotiable. It's really fun. Come on, I saved the world. I think the key for us in the film is as imaginative and absurd and funny as the world of Men in Black is. It needs to be anchored by really good actors, and the cast is fantastic. Let's do this. The Men in Black movies, it's not just big action sequences. It's clever action. We've got some fights, climbing, falling, water, cars. We've got a massive, massive chase in Morocco. That's what attracted me, was to see if we could evolve it and make it different. There should be a big red button around here somewhere. Found it. Chris Hemsworth involved was that sort of massive sort of draw for me because he's hilarious. I think the action in this film is much more grounded in reality than the superhero world that I've been a part of. His skill set, there is a sort of ability in martial arts, sort of ability, I guess, there's no heightened superpowers or anything. It has a definite, unique sort of feel to it and things I've done before. Action! MIP, freeze! On the ground! Adventure and stunts and action goes hand in hand with Men in Black. That doesn't look good. Our stunt coordinator, Wade Eastwood, did the last Mission Impossible movie and is so good at that scope and that action. But the fun thing about, I think, action inside of a Men in Black movie is it's still funny. I was attracted to this project for that reason, to be able to fuse comedy and action. On the ground. Hands Hold up. down. Hands up. Hands up. There's always these really fun set pieces that only happen in this zany world. There's a moment in the movie in which there's a shootout, and surprisingly enough, it's Molly's choice to find the biggest gun and start wailing with it. It was a very conscious choice. Right. We wanted to go against the stereotype that just because she was the bookish one who studied her way into all of this, that she wasn't capable of real physical action. And luckily in Tessa, if you, you see her in Thor, she's a wonderful physical actress. We do a lot of rehearsals and a lot of training. I'm renowned for it. They come into my workshop of hell, and we work them really hard. With Tess, she was game. She was really game. Well, huh. It's a really dynamic fight, getting to square off with Rebecca Ferguson, who's so fun. We had so much fun together. I loved the fighting. But it's the three-armed fighting. <laughs> How do you smack with something on your back? 
Ray's character has three arms, which was a part of the fun and also the challenge of shooting it because you are constantly taking hits from an imaginary arm. We do get close to each other. I think I've hit her once. She has one on me now. She did punch me once for real, <laughs> but I think that helped us both say, okay, we really have to get our timing together. Getting beat up on camera is much harder than beating someone up in terms of what it demands technically, and certainly it's just harder on your body. And in any time I was like, ugh, when it was right on the brink of painful, he'd be like, great, perfect print. So it was a tough fight. He put us through our paces, but it was so worth it. The truth is the, the best of fights are just basically a dance. They're like a violent dance. So just trying to find that rhythm and it just seems like it's gonna be when it's all cut together such a dynamic fight of a lot of arms <laughs> oh, I felt good there's a fight in this movie with Luca and H and with Chris Chris is an athlete he's done a lot of action movies and he's very good in choreography and he gets it very quickly I think the alien that I was up against was another foot or so taller than me and certainly was more gifted in the sort of strength and <laughs> the fighting areas than, than my character was. Chris is just very quick on finding the comedy moments. He's hilarious. He's one of the funniest guys to be around. So we'd let him go with it. I think the physical comedy I find sometimes that gets the biggest laugh. You know, it's about trying to not overdo that, but find moments where your character is snappy with a dialogue, also sort of saying nothing and just being ragdolled around a set. <laughs> Don't worry, don't worry, it's all part of the plan. I love my cars and bikes. Oh, this is nothing like riding a bike at all. Got it, Marker. So yeah, anytime there is something like that, it's, it's a joy. And this stuff, it's a hover bike, so it's like no bike in the world. So it's pretty unique. So a normal motorbike moves in a certain lean angle, a certain way, the hover bike, well, we don't know what a hover bike does, but we're coming up with all these sorts of movements. We're saying it moves more like a jet ski in the water. When we go to Morocco, there's a big sort of chase sequence through the streets of Morocco on that bike. We rehearsed that a few weeks ago, and that was a lot of fun. And did a lot of driving, the handbrake turns and donuts. That was cool. I haven't done that kind of extensive rehearsal with cars or bikes before in the film. It took me long enough. I had to learn how to ride this thing. On the car side, we had a big sequence in there. I get Chris drifting and doing some pretty cool car stuff as well, which he hadn't done before. And he took to that really quickly. What I try and do is keep as much of the action as real as possible, so that we keep as much in-camera real action with our heroes, with Chris Hemsworth and Tessa Thompson, and, and they really are fighting and doing these character moments with these real beings in front of them. What we are staying true to is the Men in Black story, the alien police, the humor of Men in Black, and the tone of Men in Black, and the performances that Chris Hemsworth and Tessa are bringing to it is, uh, is very funny. Looks like the tables have turned. <coughs> Incredible catch. Oh, I haven't seen that before. I can't believe that actually works. One of the biggest challenges I think Lori and I had was to juggle what are the fundamental values that our fan base insists that are absolutely essential to the piece, and what are the things that really are ripe for reinvention. There's no men in black if there's no neuralizer, and that was the hardest prop to redesign. And story, the neuralizer is key, because the neuralizer is what keeps the mainstream public innocent of the crazy reality that's happening all around. Hi, everyone. If we could all look right here. Just drive. We've been working with interesting ways that it opens, interesting ways that it calibrates. But at the end of the day, I think you'll see that our agents pull out a thing that makes sure that people walk away without memories of the extraordinary things that they've just experienced. The next category of gadget or prop that we think is essential to Men in Black are the cars. Agent H had to have the coolest car in the entire movie. So we went with the classic Jag. I remember Gary sort of said to me, what is the quintessential British car? And I said, well, it has to be a Jaguar XJ6, doesn't it? It's a very elegant car, except we had to smash one up today, which made me want to weep. H has a classic E-type Jag, quite unique in the sense that every part of that car was also a weapon. H and M are fighting these guys and they start pulling all of these weapons out 
out the cars that become bigger and bigger and bigger and more ridiculous. Now this is more like it. It's like the type of jag you want to have, especially if there are aliens on Earth. In this film, we've got all these crazy vehicles we find Chris and M on. The hover bike is absolutely amazing. This was designed by my production designer, Charlie Wood. I worked with him on the Italian job, and I just told him, you have to come up with the coolest alien vehicle ever. And I think he did. Well, we knew we were going to be in Marrakesh. We wanted to think of a shape as far removed from being in that lovely world as possible. We wanted to come up with something which was extraordinary, different. That would be very interesting to have that practically in the streets of Marrakesh, blasting around with all these air effects, blasting people as it goes by. And bounces off a variety of walls and and he's basically just crashing and bashing his way through the streets of Marrakesh, trying to gain control of this, this beast. Hold on tight! We looked at our weapons through the lens of the fact that this Men in Black office is in England. In all aspects of the design, we're moving to a slightly more classic, slightly more elegant, slightly more historical feel for these things. We just go through so many concepts of them, so much talking about them, and now Pierre started making them in our prop manufacturing department. And the other day I saw two of the guns come through and I was like, it's gonna work, they, they, they're gonna be cool, they're gonna look good. Check, please. You know, Men in Black, there were elements to it from the get-go that were just appealing. It had the neuralizer, it had the, the dark glasses, had the big guns, and the idea of human cops who are protecting the Earth against the scum of the universe was extremely appealing. And in that was a basic idea, which is that it's a secret organization. And the implication of that is that if you tell their story, you're letting the movie audience in on a secret. I don't understand. All will be explained if you look right here. first sat down with our director, Gary Gray, we did talk about what's the feel of Men in Black in London. I mean, we shot in actual downtown London, which was so fun. And we traversed a lot of landscape in this and a lot of different settings, but it was great. Men in Black International, we take you out of New York, we take you to Morocco, we of course take you to London and Paris, coast of Naples, and we spend a little time in New York. We have to. At the beginning of the film, we're actually rebuilding some of the iconic interiors that were created for the first film. When you first go into the building, and it's where you walked in originally. Along with setting up our young Molly story in New York from the beginning, we've now built the entrance to MIB four times. <laughs> it's so cool to go on the iconic sets, like when we were in O's office, the set that we've seen before. Within a lot of the scenery, we've been building some of its practical some of it are fragment sets where we would build the necessary part of the set. The VFX department take them over. Within the art department, it allows you to do a huge range of different looks. This Men in Black really is a globe-trotting adventure. They go all over. The first three Men in Blacks are very much based on early 60s modernism. We didn't want to export that to London, but we also didn't want to just lean into what sort of the world thinks about in terms of the classical British architecture. We're going to sort of nudge it back in time a bit. And we've ended up in an era where we're basically saying in the film that the MIB International actually may have existed from, say, the turn of the century onwards. Wait, so Eiffel was an MIB agent? One of the first. So we're sort of recreating the top of the Eiffel Tower. So we're building this portal room, which is this strange set. So we had to basically get our brains into what the real inner working space of this Eiffel Tower was. You do react within your environment to the environment. And certainly when we come from London in the back lot of the studio, all of a sudden we're in Italy on the coastline. There's a whole different energy. We're going to Naples. Oh, to Rizzo's fortified fortress of for sure death. In our movie, we find Rizza in this island called Ischia in Italy. And as a location, it is probably the architecture on that island's 15th or 16th century. And we loved all of that. Marrakesh was absolutely amazing. To be able to go into the northern tip of Africa and shoot action with Chris Hemsworth and Tessa and aliens, 
you know, one more cash. Yeah, that's probably awesome. amazing. Marrakesh has a completely different visual sense to it. The heat, the light, the dust, the color palette, everything is, is a complete change from where we've been in London. Now arriving, express train from New York. In Airy Wharf, what we wanted to do was we wanted us to try to find a space that we can enhance a bit in post that would serve that, would, you know, that actually existed. And I know everyone sort of loved the architecture of that location. We have a nightclub scene where they're going to see Vungus and we've got a London taxi in, in this location just on Ludgate Hill which goes down into the Alien nightclub. We ended up actually deciding to shoot that as a location and that was in central London in a place called Billingsgate which is the old fish markets of London from the 17th century. What's I think great about these films, what they've always stayed true to, is not over exploiting the alien side of things. You know, you'd see them in the deep background, then occasionally you'd get sort of a close up of one. The first three men in black, all of the creatures were designed by a man named Rick Baker. Those characters in that context sort of get to the very heart of, I think, what's special about men in black. They're among us mostly sort of in shadow or hidden, so when you see them, there is a wow factor to it. There was one alien that we shot with yesterday, and it looks like he sort of has these mushroom type things growing out of him, or like candles, he's like a candle chandelier, and it Awesome. He looks so cool. But that's what's great about Men in Black movies is that you can really go for it when it comes to these alien designs. Visual effects, we start working with them when we're done shooting. We start digging in with the characters when we start actually building the models and working with their textures and seeing them as 3D characters themselves. Of the characters we have up here on the board, several of them are going to be fully CG. So if it's an acting part like Pawnee. The actor will be offset, but he'll wear a head-mounted camera unit. We'll have two cameras and lights, and he will actually act out and say his lines. So we'll actually capture his facial expressions, and that'll be embedded in the character himself when he's modeled and designed. We do not kill Jabavians nor participate, participate in, in the murder, murder thereof. This is non-negotiable. Have a look at the evolution of alien high tea. This is really where the design process began. It was wanting to bring so some sort of hive or spore creature out. The creativity flowed from there, really. You can sort of see the evolution of it. And as it got bigger and bigger, these are sort of designed to be about 15 to 20 feet tall. <laughs> the Men in Black Universe is a very specific type of alien. They're quite kiddie friendly, really. And when it came to AHT, we were told we didn't have to stick to those boundaries. We could go as scary as we wanted. You know, I'm tasked very often playing someone that's new to this world with having excitement or wonderment looking around, and it's been very easy for me to do because the designs and these set pieces and everything is so beautiful and so imaginative, really and truly. You're up. You were meditating so loudly. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that. That's just... <sighs> I'm curious. How'd you do it? What saved the world? Easy with nothing but my wits, my serious Series 7. 7 de-atomizer. No, I mean, how did you get in? How did they recruit you? Oh, well, I'd like to think it was my sheer, unadulterated, God-given talent. Yeah, I'd like to think so, too. What was it, really? Ah, uh, I stole the wrong car, is the truth. Yeah, or the right car, depending on how you look at it. It was a, uh, a vintage Jag, beautiful thing, the kind you didn't see very often where I was from. So a mate of mine says to me, hey, uh, I bet you can't hotwire that thing. So I do jump in, and there in the back seat, I realize is a class four Gomorite and handcuff. A class four, a class four. Oh my God, I crushed. Those are the ones with the, uh, <laughs> yeah. was it reticulated, inverted, <laughs> what? Both, I think. What did it do? Right, so, so the thing freaks out, right? Leaps up, rips the roof off the car, ran off down the road, teeth snarling toward the guy I stole the car from. Right, so I look over and there's this, this big chrome pistol sitting on the seat, and I think, what the hell? So I pick it up, right? Wait, no, you didn't. And I did, I did. I leveled my sights, big, deep breath, and boom! 
Mm. Purple guts everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. Oh, the perfect shot. Guts everywhere. All over him, all over me. Disgusting. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> all right, so, so this guy back then, his name was just T. Wait, I'm sorry, Pauls. You mean to tell me that you tried to steal High T's car? Yeah, I didn't try to steal it, did steal it, right? So, so T pops on a pair of shades, pulls out his neuralizer, he's about to wipe me. And I say, mate, I, I don't know about you and where you're from, but around here, if someone does you a solid, you buy that man a pint. And one thing leads to another, and by the end of the night, he's offering me a job. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so you mean to tell me that you got a job for a highly specialized individual over a beer? It wasn't just a beer. I quite love beer, actually. <laughs> And how did High T know that he could trust you? I mean, you technically committed a felony. Well, yeah, it seems to be the running theme in this company, doesn't it? Didn't you uh, hack into the Hubble telescope, the world's most secure closed network system ever? Someone did their homework. Hmm. Stalker. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they had lots of pictures. Yeah. So how long are you here for, buddy? Uh, Vangus go home tomorrow. Tomorrow? Hmm. Well, we better make it a good one, huh? Well, I came to talk, Edge. We need to speak. Ah, talking Smokey. Come on, I want to see you dance. Come on. Come, come on. on. I know. Oh. I know this is your jam. Get oh, out of here. M, come on. Oh, no. I'm just going to. I like to butt dance. No, come on. Hey, hey, I need to talk to you about something. If it's about that night in Beirut, I deleted the photos. Promise. That's where. Beirut. Just. Damn right it is. Night is young. <laughs> What's wrong? You're not feeling it? Should I get them to play something with a bit more of a healthy vibe? Uh, listen to me. This is serious. serious. Oh, you're the only one that one can trust. Feeling spiritual. What happened to you? <laughs> what are you talking about? What happened to you? The only one you can trust. Why are you so serious all of a sudden? Relax. Oh, yeah. Those guys. Oh, I know. It's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> Fists so good. Vodka cranberry shot, pack a punch. Uh, let's get his car and get him out of here. Uh, uh, <laughs> H. Yeah, you're not that good. Come on. Loosen up a bit. Hey, everyone. Listen up. Before we have to neuralize every last civilian watching this to protect the universe's best kept secrets, I invited my friend, Pawnee, over to take a quick look back at some of the highlights of MIB International. You know, I'm actually pretty excited about this, Frank, because frankly, when you're saving the world from total annihilation, you don't always remember every little detail. All right, whatever you say, newbie. The guy tried to sneak in behind a pussy in meteor shower. <laughs> amateur hour, am I right? Right as rain. She's talking about amateur hour. 
Hey, you gonna call this in or what? I'm sorry, Frank. I blinked for like a moment. Did I miss the entirety of your role in this movie? Talk to me when you show up in two more MIB movies. There are no small parts, just small chess pieces. That's Agent M, the greatest agent to ever wear the suit. Queen of all queens, mother of chess pawns. Anyway, she doesn't know it yet here, but I'm going to come into her life and change it forever as we save the world together. I think I kind of rocked that suit better, but she looks pretty great in it too. Men in black and morons in black, if you ask me. <laughs> what a bunch of dicks, am I right? That's Agent H. He's... he's okay. I just set him straight a little, teach him a little of how the universe works. Right! And FYI, your little club here sucks. That looks like fun. Wonder if they'd let me put my head out the window. This is MIB London headquarters. They're currently building my office. It'll be a little bit bigger than H's, but I'm not gonna let it get to my head. This is a great place. Well, it ain't New York. Okay, here comes H into the office, and he's walking in slow-mo again. What's up with that guy? Man, is he ever dreamy or what? Did I just say that? And moving on. Hello, Anne. I like that Agent M. She's the brains of this outfit. And if something terrible happens to H, God forbid, I'd be her partner in a flash. I am so there. Mom, that position is already filled, and I will fight you to the death right now. Pawns have queens. You get a walker. Yeah, but I'm off leash, so you better watch it. He thinks you're hot. He thinks I'm what, sorry? Oh. Boy, those twins can dance. I wanted to be a dancer, but they said my legs were too short. Come on. I can move. Never trusted these two guys for a minute. Anyone who can dance like that has to be an alien. And there's two of them? No way. Am I right, Frank? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I tuned out as soon as you started talking. One more step and I'll liquefy your bangs, pretty boy. Do not move. Uh, Let's see that again. Uh, Frank. Uh, Frank. Uh, Here comes trouble. Uh, that Bassam is a massive jerk. So disappointing that H trusted him. And I thought I had a flea problem. You thinking what I'm thinking? Call Riza. Hold on tight! I'm a little jealous of how much time they spend with you, Bonnie. Well, I'm an integral part of the operation and would never leave M's side. Well, almost, I guess. They almost lost me on that hover bike ride. Wait for me! Thanks! <laughs> uh, huh. I can't believe that actually worked! Oh, hello. That lady with the third arm gives me the creeps, but also turns me on at the same time. It's oh. confusing. That's a snub nose casting annihilator. Do you know what that does to a human body? If things didn't work out with them, I think Riza could also be a good queen. It boils you from the inside out. Cute. You psycho! Ah, ah. Or not. Fun fact. Every year, lots of aliens come to the Eiffel Tower looking to joyride the portal to other galaxies. I love Paris during an alien invasion. It clears out the tourists. There's no stopping this. Oh yeah, this is my favorite part of the movie. I love kicking alien scum butt. I'm not losing another queen. <laughs> it's good, right? I'm so glad I got this opportunity to share my adventures with you, Frank. This is how it's done, as they say, out in the field. Right time? Right place. Welcome to the circus, Agent M. You are no longer probationary. Well, there you go. My work here is done, I guess. You are. I'm sorry, what? Probationary head of London Branch. Congratulations, Proby. Congratulations to you, too. This has been fun, folks. But now I think it's time to bust out the Neuralizer. Open wide and say, ah.
I think one of the standout aspects of this movie are our new villains. Bill Gurry Gray was at our office in Santa Monica and asked Lori and me to look at a tape of two extraordinary dancers named Le Twin. Their biggest strength to me was their small twitch movement. Without talking, they managed to find this frequency exactly at the same moment every time. Well, I haven't seen that before. The first time we see them, which is in a nightclub, and they're trying to sort of mimic dancers around them, and then they do their own thing, is one of the most impressive things I've ever seen. I was on set long after I'd been wrapped, just kind of watching in awe <laughs> what these guys were doing. There's something very unnerving about the way they move and sort of in synchronicity. They're fantastic dancers, whom a lot of people know from having toured with Beyonce for six years. They're incredible at, at movement. I think some of the movements that Laurent and Larry can do get integrated into the way that they sort of, you know, move through space. Keep the energy up. Sometimes you need a little boost. It boosts everything. Boost morale, boost creativity. I think it's a good thing to do. It's so easy to find aliens in these things, and now every story's insane. I've got it. NBA players. Supernatural abilities, insane physiques. I think we'd probably find some aliens in there. Wait a second, wait a second. What about the NBA? Their skills, their clothes, their bodies, their athleticism. Those guys, they must be aliens. Let's investigate. Okay, have you been neuralizing yourself again? Yeah, a little bit. I felt good at first, and now I think I'm starting to pay the price. Your court vision is the stuff of legend. Just like the eyes in the back of your head. We know everything. I know everything, huh? Mm-hmm. Oh, missed us. Can't hide from MIB. Mm-mm. We'll be watching you. And I'll be watching you right back. We'll be watching you watch us right back, won't we? We can do this all day. Yeah, good. Let's do it. Still watching. They're watching. I'm leaving. Hmm? Yeah, I can see you, pal. I'm not gonna stop seeing you. My eyes don't get tight. I haven't even blinked yet. Russell Westbrook, NBA MVP of fashion. I gotta say, this closet is insane. And the bush? What? Men in black, huh? Here for an upgrade? Frequently changing appearance. That's very common for aliens with something to hide. You're not tripping. You know we can see you changing. Yeah. No, no, not me. Shape-shifting. You know that is a very useful skill for an alien. Or an agent. Good point. I make this look good. I've seen better. Who? Some guy. It was a long time ago. Anthony Davis. We've been hearing some pretty crazy rumors about you. What are you talking about? Well, I don't know, something about maybe your superhuman wingspan? can you just have one of those faces, a interesting alien face? It's kind of rude, bro. AD, you're an alien. Funny story, I took one of those DNA tests, zero percent alien. How bad, we'll just walk ourselves out. Watch this. Gotcha. All right, all right, I'm sort of an alien. So, yeah, we know. And that was goaltending. Got another distress call from HQ. Ugh, HQ and their phone calls. I mean, just just text us. I think we're gonna need backup on this one. It might be time to call in those NBA aliens. <laughs> Good idea. You know, you'd think the prospect of me working with these tall, athletic, gifted, talented guys, you know, would intimidate me somewhat, but it doesn't. Pretty good at basketball myself, actually, you know. Could have gone pro, but I uh, decided to save the world instead. 